We heard in the epistle about this theme of the cheerful giver. The cheerful giver. This is a topic, the topic of tithing or the topic of giving to the Lord, which often makes people uncomfortable. Tragically then, it is often avoided in many churches, the topic. My salary does not change on how much you put into the basket. If you don't donate enough, the eparchy will cover it. If you donate more, it remains the same. So what I'm saying to you right now has nothing to do with the income of my home, but the income of your home. This is your home. This is the home that is more important than the home you may have in Morgan Hill or in San Jose or Fremont or Gilroy or wherever you're from. This is your permanent home. That's the home that you are currently living in, the place you are staying. It may be a very nice place. You may be there for many years. You may die in that house. Or you may move. But the church is your permanent home. The church is your permanent home. And so we must care for it. We must take care of it more than we care for these temporary dwellings of ours. We need to ponder this idea, how much do we build up our own temporary shelter, which sometimes will be sold or who knows what, while the house of God is in shambles. We are very blessed in the St. Elias community to have this place here right now where we worship. But of course, it is a little on the small side. Right? And when we have extra visitors, come on in. There's plenty of room. When we have extra, it gets a little tight in here. Sometimes the air conditioning is just not strong enough. And you start to sweat. Oh, how we suffer here in America. Sometimes it's a little on the chilly side because the heater just doesn't put out enough heat. Sometimes your legs get tired because there's not enough seating. Well, look at me. You'll notice that I don't sit the entire service and I had been serving at the altar an hour before the service began with our morning prayer. Okay? Look at the servers. Look at the others who have been here standing. As you know, pews were invented by the Protestants. Okay, we have in our churches today this this idea of of uh, you know the fancier the pews, the more traditional it is. Well, the more traditionally Protestant it is, maybe. It is the Protestants who first started building benches all over into the structure of the church so that they could sit during the long two, three, four hour sermons of Martin Luther. Thank God. I don't stay, I take that long. You get 10, 15 minutes, right, Ramon? Max? <laughs> He's always timing me. So, our, the, the, in the church, in the church, here where we stand and we worship and we pray to God, this is our most important place. This is our most important place. Nadia, there's room up here. This is our most important place. Okay? So, I want you to read carefully the epistle when you go home. It's on the bulletin. Make sure you take a copy of the bulletin home. If you didn't get a copy or you forget, it was emailed to you. And if you don't have the email, you can go on the website. Okay? The email there has for you the epistle reading. The bulletin has the epistle reading where St. Paul addresses this issue about giving joyfully to the Lord. Do we want a bigger church that maybe has more room? Sometimes I hear from some parishioners, Abuna, we need to go find something bigger. Well, yes. But our pocketbook needs to be bigger before we can go do that. Okay? I would, I would like St. Elias within 10 years. My hope is that within 10 years, we will have a big, beautiful church here in San Jose, properly attired with the iconography muraled on the walls and on the ceiling, and that our church will be 
the pillar of orthodoxy here in San Jose. That's my hope. We already have influenced other churches. You may think, how? I told you about our bulletin. I told you about our website. Our website is the most heavily trafficked website of all the churches in the Melkite Church. I get phone calls and emails constantly from other parishes saying thank you for the information that's on that website. We use it constantly for training of our choir, etc. The same with the bulletin. It has become a model that the diocese has chosen to look at for making an, a, a template for all the parishes. There is an Orthodox church here in town that was not celebrating Vespers every Saturday evening. And finally, when their parishioners complained that, why is St. Elias celebrating Vespers every Saturday evening and we are not? They finally now have Vespers on Saturday evenings. We are to be a standard by which all else is judged. This is our calling. Again, read the epistle. Read the back of the bulletin. There is a wonderful discussion of the theme of giving from the Old and New Testament and from the fathers of the church. Please make sure you read the, the uh, bulletin this week when you take it home and make sure you read the back. A very wonderful discussion of that topic. More on that another time. Now, in the gospel we heard about the raising of a young man in the city of Naim. This is a tragic situation. This is not just a dead child, which is a horrible tragedy. But this meant the death of a family. The woman's husband had already died. She was a widow. Her only hope for legal representation, for income when she is older, for protection, for security, was this boy who would grow up and take over the household for his dead father. And now he has died as well. What a tragedy. Jesus has pity on the woman and raises the boy from the dead with the simple words, Arise, my son. And he gives him back to the mother. How different is Jesus' worldview than the worldview we have here in America, where we glorify death, we play with demons, walk into the CVS, into the Walmart, even into Home Depot, for God's sake, covered with images of demons, of Satan of witches, witchcraft, and death. Death is an insult thrown in the face of God. Death is not a punishment which God gave to mankind. Death is the result of turning away from our source of life. That action is called sin. And as the Bible tells us, Sin came into the world, and with it came death. On the day Adam and Eve turned away from God and chose to turn that tree into an idol, to a pagan god, and say, in this I will have joy, as opposed to in the words of our Creator, they died that day. And the sign that they were dead in their soul was that they hid from each other and they hid from God. What a great tragedy. And with spiritual death, eventually comes physical death. And as you know in the story of the Bible, after Adam, and from there until today, like the story in the Gospel today, death has become part of our experience. Death may be very common, but it is not normal. <clears throat> You may hear people say, well, this is natural. This is, part this is not natural. Death is unnatural. God created man to live for eternity. That was his original plan. 
And through the envy of the devil, as the Book of Wisdom tells us, death entered the world. Jesus Christ came to conquer sin and death. To conquer sin and death. And through our baptism into Him, as St. Paul says, we are buried with Him and we rise with Him to newness of life. When Jesus returns, He will raise your bodies from the dead. When will that be? It could be during this liturgy. It could be in five years from now. It could be in 10,000 years from now. Who knows? We might be the early church. But Jesus has said He will return. And when He returns, He will raise us from the dead. Anyone who has died before His return. And He will bring with Him, St. Paul tells us in his first epistle to the Thessalonians, the souls of those who have died before. And they will receive their bodies back. We will be judged by what we have done. And those in their bodies who have acted wickedly, who have not walked in accord with the loving will of of their Father, will be cast into the lake of eternal fire. But those who have sought after the will of their Creator, who have turned away from the iniquity of Adam and Eve of old, back to the embrace of their Father, will enter back into the Garden of Eden reestablished and dwell with God for all eternity here on earth. That was God's plan from the beginning and His plan will not be thwarted. The question is, how will we participate in it? How will we participate in it? You hear in the prayers of the liturgy over and over, may we commend our whole life, our whole life, not part of it, but our whole life, to Christ God, through the intercession of the Mother of God and all of His saints. Do we? Do we say these prayers like a Pharisee from the first century, but not really attempt to abide by our our words? Do we live our whole life in accord with the will of God? Or is our faith, our time here on Sunday, one compartment among a number of other things we do in our life. We go to the gym. We work out. We go to church. We pray. We watch TV. We go to the theater. Are these different components in our life? Or rather, is our life at the gym? or our life at the movie theater, or what we choose to watch on TV, or whether we have a TV or not in the house. How we live our life influenced by the most important thing, in fact, the only thing which gives life, and that is our faith. I ask you these questions because of the Gospel reading. Notice when Jesus came, He didn't see a boy who was dead alive and lay him onto a stretcher dead. He saw a boy who was dead and raised him to life. The ancient pagan culture of northern Europe, the Celtics, before they were evangelized by the church, were into all sorts of horrible demonic activity, child sacrifice and the rest. One of the things they did during October was prepare for the great feast, for the great feast that was coming on November 1st, the New Year. The night before the New Year, October 31st, as the sun is beginning to wane, As the days are becoming shorter, they saw this as the death of the year. The year was over. And this is Northern Europe, of course. Everything's dead by then. It's not California. So, the leaves have fallen from the trees. Everything has been harvested. And the year is now over. 
The next day, November 1st, is the beginning of the new year, which started, as ancient people saw, in the darkness. As the Semites also saw the new day beginning in the darkness of the night. On that night, they believed that the veil between the other world and this world was thinner. That a door was opened through which the souls of those who had gone before and various other types of spirits would begin to roam the earth. And so they would put outside their doors sweets, hoping to appease the demons and the spirits and the souls walking by, wandering on the streets, keeping them from coming into the house. Today we have people playing with Ouija boards inside the house. But back then they at least had the good sense, even as a pagan, that they didn't want this stuff in the house, so they would put treats, offerings for these things. Now this is all paganism. There are no demons wandering around on that day particularly, or any other day. This is all the nonsense of the devil. But this is what they believed. And so in the Roman church, which originally had its feast of all saints, in the memory of all the baptized, all souls, as one feast, moved it from May to October and November, in order to offset this pagan activity to try to displace it. And it worked. It worked very well. As the Northern Europeans were evangelized, they were shown that there, there's a certain truth in their, in their understanding that there is another world. Yes. And you are to remember those who have gone before us. Yes. So there's this element of truth in what you say. And so the church began to celebrate the feast of all saints and all souls to offset this and successfully until, for the most part, America. When you have Christians coming from Europe to the United States and creating all sorts of new traditions and doctrines, some of the elements that were eventually developed had some beginnings in Ireland and Scotland. But you know the celebration today. Any of you who are old enough may remember here in the United States when what happens on what we call Halloween today did not happen. This is an activity that developed primarily in the way we have it today in the late 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s, until today. With every year that passes, Halloween becomes more and more like the ancient pagan festival and less and less like the Christian celebration. With every year that passes, the United States is moving faster and faster towards the religion of the pagan Northern Europeans. You might say, this is just, these are games, aren't they? I mean, a, a child dresses up as a witch. Eh, it's just playing around, right? Do you let your child play with a knife? Do you let your child play with electricity? Things that are dangerous? Ask any exorcist. Father Gary Thomas is here in San Jose, a relatively famous exorcist. And they will tell you, this is not for your children to be doing. We don't have our children dress up like demons and witches and expect when they're adults they'll, they'll want to be Christian. Because when they grow up, they will want to be like that they have played. Hmm? Don't we encourage our children? You might see your child playing, dressing up as a, a nun. We go, oh, wow, maybe she'll be a nun someday. Right? You might see one of your boys uh, swinging something in the house. Oh, it looks like he's going to be a deacon, maybe. Or he says, or, and sometimes families will get, I've seen this, a little set of things so the, the little boy who wants to, maybe, who wants to pretend like he's a priest in the home. He goes around blessing things with water and stuff. Hmm? And what is in your mind? Ah, this will maybe have an influence on him, and maybe someday he'll be a priest. 
But for some reason, the logic breaks down when the child is dressed, walking around the house with a pitchfork and horn sticking out of their head, or when the child is walking around in the form of a witch. Witches are real. Witches are real. When I was in college, I tragically encountered one. I didn't know she was a witch. She had just innocently got involved in a little of this, a little of that, and over a year or two, she had fallen into full-blown witchcraft. And as I began to speak to her, I thought she was a Christian, as I began to speak to her about Jesus and the church, she began to flinch and twitch. There was something wrong with her. The more I spoke to her about Jesus, the whiter her face came, and she started to gag, and she looked like she was going to throw up. I didn't know what was wrong. I thought she'd bad lunch, maybe. <laughs> and then the more I talked, the more, the more violent her reaction became, to the point that she got up and ran into the bathroom. We were at a restaurant at this point, and threw up. Well, whatever she did there. She came back out. I asked her, what's going on? Every time I say Jesus, you start acting very strangely. And then she began to tell me her story of how she had gotten involved with Ouija boards and all this other stuff and casting spells. We burned her books and thank God, as far as I know, she's okay today. This is not something to play with. This is not something we want our children to play with. We do not bring these things into our home. We do not bring these things into our family. And so, we have also, I encourage you, if you have children that are of the age that they like to dress up, we have an alternative for them. Dressing up is nice because you dress up into the things that you, you want to be like as a child. A doctor, whatever, who knows what it is. They dress up and they play these games. So we have, as we did last year, we will have again this year, in conjunction with the St. Basil community, an All Saints party on October 31st here at the church. We come and we begin with prayer here in the church, Vespers, short for the children. And then we will go into the hall and there the children will eat dinner provided by the church, some pizza or who knows, something like that. And then the children will play games. We have wonderful little games about the saints. And the children who have come dressed up as saints from the Old Testament, the New Testament, or the history of the church, then will tell us all about their saint and why they chose to dress up as that saint and how they want to imitate that saint in their lives, as opposed to imitating a witch, or a demon, or Satan himself. Let us glorify Jesus Christ in our daily life, with every breath we take as long as we have left here on this earth. If it's in our giving, as St. Paul talks about in the epistle, if it's in the gym, if it's in the workplace, in the school, on the street, in the neighborhood, wherever we are, let us glorify Jesus Christ in everything we do with His eternal Father and His all-holy, good, and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever and into ages of ages. Amen.